And let me introduce our uh, first moderator, who is David Kramer, um, and just tell you a little bit about David. So David is currently, which is new, a senior fellow at the v Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy, which sort of, I love this, because it kind of brings the conversation about uh, diplomacy, human rights, um, and the future of democracy to kind of a nice full circle, reminding us of Eastern Europe and the kind of lessons we have from Eastern Europe for helping countries build uh, democracy. And I think the Czech Republic, among so many of its um, neighbors, has been a little more successful than the others. So just, I wanted to make that little pitch. Uh, prior to that, he was at the McCain Institute for International Leadership um, at, um, at, I think, at ASU, is that right? Yes. At, at ASU. Um, he's had a number of positions inside the government, and like so many of the people here today, has gone back and forth between government and um, academia, which is um, something I was reflecting on last night, of, of thinking about a number of individuals who have gone recently from government, from the Obama administration and elsewhere, into the universities, and maybe that will make our universities a little more helpful and responsive to the affairs of the world, which I think is something that would be a very good direction to go in. So without further ado, David. Karen, thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me and including me and to you and your great team and, and the co-sponsors here. It's great to be in New York <coughs> on this very important subject, and uh, the the title is Ukraine and U.S. Policy Options, but since we have a Canadian and a Brit up here, um, we're going to broaden that and not just talk about U.S. policy options, but the uh, responsibilities of the West as a, as a whole and what we need to do to help Ukraine. The, the three panelists up here, I think, need no introduction. I'm reminded when Henry Kissinger was told uh, he, he is a man who needs no introduction, he famously said, but it's always nice to hear. Um, <laughs> but I'm still going to forgo that in this case, other than to give a very brief introduction of, of these superb panelists. Uh, Dr. Ulana Saprun is currently the uh, Minister of Health, uh, has been in that position since July of 2016, uh, was born in, in Michigan, grew up there, um, and uh, to show her dedication to Ukraine, went to, to help the Ukrainians through their grave crisis, and has done a remarkable job uh, in, her, in her capacity at the Ministry of Health. To my left is Jill, Saint Clair, uh, Jill Sinclair, I'm currently with the Strategic Joint Staff, appointed by the Chief of Defense Staff and Deputy Minister as uh, Canada's representative to the Ukrainian uh, DRAB, um, uh, not a great uh, acronym, I agree, General. Um, and Jill has had a very distinguished career in the Canadian government and also someone I've known through the Halifax International Security Forum. So Jill, thanks very much for being here. Uh, General Sir Nick Parker um, is also an advisor for the UK on reform to the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. He's a retired British Army officer and currently director of the team Rubicon UK, as well as chairman of both Salute My Job and Step Up to Serve. General, it's a great privilege to have you here with us as well. Um, Lana, let me start with you and ask you to look at what you've been able to accomplish, recognizing there's still an enormous amount to do in, in the health field, but give us your perspective on what has worked in, in what you're trying to do in the health ministry and how it might be applied elsewhere through the Ukrainian government. What would have been sort of the three keys of success that you think could translate to, to other fields? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me and for having me sit on this uh, panel. Um, it seems that I'm the um, only official representative of the Ukrainian government, and that doesn't mean that I speak for the entire Ukrainian government, the president, and everyone else. Uh, mostly I'm speaking from myself and from the, um, uh, from the perspective of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine. Um, I believe some of the changes that have happened over the last couple of years um, really are driven by a difference in the uh, Hroisman government compared to the Yatsenyuk government. The Yatsenyuk government came in when there was uh, no money, no army, uh, attacked by the Russians. Ukraine was fighting for its existence, its, uh, uh, its existential being. And there were very many moves made at that time just to keep Ukraine alive. 
Um, a couple of years passed and the Hroisman government came in and uh, began to look more at what's needed for the people of Ukraine. Uh, not only looking at just defense or just the financial question, but also um, as uh, Volodymyr Hroisman is a mayor, um, he understood that people need to see changes that they can actually see and feel in their everyday lives. So fixing the roads, uh, increasing pensions, uh, increasing the minimal pay, uh, also health care reform. Those are the kinds of things that will change people's everyday lives. And I believe that that, uh, that idea is what's driving a lot of these reforms forward. What we have done, um, especially in medical reform, is we've realized that you can't just look at the long uh, game. You have to also look at the short game. It's great to have your Hail Mary and wait until you get into the end zone, but um, you have to show progress along the way. So instead of just focusing on a three-year plan to completely transform the healthcare system, create a national health insurance, and start uh, paying at point of service rather than uh, an input-based system, what we've done is we've had um, uh, successes along the way that helped people understand that changes were happening. One very important one was a, is a uh, program we call Accessible Medicines. For the first time in Ukraine, um, well, up until now, 97% of all prescription medicines were paid for out of pocket by Ukrainians. So for the first time, we introduced a uh, reimbursement program where if you, if you get a prescription from your family physician, you can go to a pharmacy that takes part voluntarily takes part in the program and you get your medicines at no cost or with a small copay and the national health insurer pays at the level of the pharmacy. So people who at one point in their lives had to choose with their pensions whether they take their medicine or they eat, now we're receiving their medicines on a regular basis. Um, it really brought in that older community, the retirees and the pensioners, uh, because now they were getting their medicines on a regular basis. Um, another change that we did, a short-term change that uh, uh, allowed people to see a difference, is uh, we started with primary health care, and for the first time ever, Ukrainians are able to choose their own physician. In the past, they were assigned a clinic based on where their registration was, uh, where they were registered as, uh, as their residents. Um, now they can choose whichever physician they want. They sign through an electronic health care system. They sign a, a declaration with them, and now they can choose their own physician, and that physician has a list of services that they're so, supposed to provide at no cost to the patient. It's been so successful that 18 and a half million Ukrainians have signed up in the first six months of the program. There are about officially 42 million Ukrainians. The Ministry of Finance counts 38 million Ukrainians. There probably are about 34 million Ukrainians. So that's about 50% of the population. Um, that's a, a pretty, pretty good um, uh, difference in, in people's lives. And then uh, one of the last things, uh, a third thing that we did that people noticed uh, from the very beginning is um, we uh, created uh, cardiology centers throughout Ukraine where uh, there's uh, co-financing between local and federal government. And uh, within one and a half hours of any point in Ukraine, a patient who's having a heart attack can make it to a cardiology center where an angiography suite is uh, available. And uh, the stents, the cardiac stents that are put in have been procured through international organizations and are uh, provided at no cost to the patient. Um, some of the anti-corruption uh, work that has been done has helped us to free up a lot of funds. And that's another lesson to be learned by other ministries. If you cut out corruption, you find an awful lot of more money that's available for the things that you need. For instance, we uh, handed over our public procurement of medicines to international organizations like UNICEF and UNDP and Crown Agents. And we were able to free up 40% of the funding because of the decrease in prices when we went on an international market. And we're talking about a lot of money because every year we have 5.9 billion hryvnia that we spend on uh, medications. So that's an awful lot of money. Another uh, way of cutting out, um, cutting out uh, uh, corruption is, as uh, the general said, is being more transparent in where the money goes and uh, uh, with um, a transparent system where the rules are the same for all. 
Uh, what we have are registries now for patients where um, we know who the um, insulin is being given to. We started a registry of uh, insulin-dependent diabetics, and what we found was on paper there were 250,000 patients, but in real life there are really only 170,000 patients. And the savings from that one program by creating simple creating a registry of patients is 500 million hryvnia a year. So when you save 500 million hryvnia in one place and you save 3 billion hryvnia in another place, you free up a lot more money to be able to provide services for people. So my lessons are look at the long game because it's important, but you have to have some quick wins or else the people will not have the patience to make it through to the long game. Number two, transparency. Transparency, people trust you. Talk, tell the truth and show what's really going on behind the scenes. People want to know that and they want to see it. And number three, cut out the corruption. You'll free up a lot more money and you'll be able to do a, a lot more of the reforms. Let me just, before turning to the, <clears throat> the panelists, let me just push you um, on the corruption point, though, Alana, mm -hmm. if I could. The, there are, as you know better than I do, people at very high levels, perhaps even the highest levels of the government, who don't want exactly what you just laid out, transparency and end to corruption. They, in fact, view this as their opportunity to engage in it themselves, enrich themselves while they can, and try to keep the opposition from coming in and maybe uh, returning the favor. Is there a role for the West, for the international community, to play in applying pressure on those who are engaging in corruption? It is, after all, a theme of the Revolution of Dignity from 2013-14 that people wanted an end to that corrupt Yanukovych government, but to many Ukrainians, they don't see a huge improvement since then. Uh, the way that I think is best to deal with corruption is the same way as we uh, physicians want to treat disease, prevention. Mm -hmm. Not punishment mm -hmm. later, not treatment when you're in stage four cancer, but let's do preventative measures or early detection so we never get to stage four cancer. That's a much better way of doing things. And that's what we're doing with the healthcare system. That's what the military should be doing in the Ministry of Defense. It's creating a system where corruption is not endemic, where it's not allowed, where you can't even figure out how to be corrupt because the system doesn't allow you to do so. Right now, the system in, uh, the medical system in Ukraine is is uh, designed to be corrupt. The physicians are paid very low wages. All of it is run by government. The tenders are run by government. It's really just set up in such a way for somebody to be able to uh, make money off of it. So if you change the rules, you make equal rules for all, fair play, transparency. Um, uh, in, if there are breaking of the rules, there is some very strict punishment. Until now, um, we don't have licensing of medical professionals, and we don't have any way of taking away financing from a hospital if it's not producing um, good results when it comes to treating patients, because all hospitals got the amount of money that they get from the budget with no, um, no oversight at all. So now that we have a national, national health insurance, if a hospital is not providing the services, if a physician is not providing the proper services or doing uh, harm to his patients, at least we have a financial means in which to um, uh, cause some pain in that person's life by cutting them off financially. So um, I think that the best way of doing all of this is having the West support those reformers that are changing the system and putting in place the right procedures, fair play, transparency so that if there is any, uh, any corruption, we, we find it early. And then, of course, uh, continuing to support uh, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, the uh, Special Anti-Prosecutor's Office, and the uh, Anti-Corruption Court, so that if we do find corruption, we can treat that corruption by putting somebody in prison. Um, and corruption, you know, it's not something that's just endemic to Ukraine. Uh, I was Absolutely. just in Chicago, sure. and the last three governors of <laughs> Illinois are sitting in, uh, in prison. However, they're sitting in prison. Right. Exactly. That's so exactly. there is corruption, but there's punishment yeah. for that corruption, and that's what we need to get in Ukraine. It's that last step. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Jill, let me turn to you. And there are some people who, who believe here we are October 2nd, presidential election scheduled for the end of March, that not much is going to happen between now and then, that things are going to get caught up in the presidential <clears throat> politics and electoral politics. And yet, as the general and the ambassador said last night, 
there was a hot war still uh, un underway in the East where Ukrainians on a daily basis are being injured and, and even killed. Um, we, you look at the problem of corruption that the, that the minister just talked about. Uh, Ukraine is awaiting the IMF loan. As you look at it from your perspective, from the Canadian government's perspective, how would you describe the priorities? What can we expect realistically between now and the election and then post-election? Well, thanks, David. And let me thank the organizers of the conference to begin with and welcome the cadets who arrived. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> it was an inside joke. We'll fill you in it later. We're, we're happy don't you're here. Don't take it personally. Yes, and we're happy breakfast. you're here. Yeah, and getting breakfast. Please don't take it personally. Yeah. There's more of you than me. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, look, David, I think um, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm fascinated the extent to which we're um, slightly obsessed by the election. I think it's great. I mean, this is, uh, this is routine for democratic countries. Mm -hmm. And I think what's encouraging about this is that Ukraine is going into an election. And in fact, there's gonna be two elections. We got the presidential election, then we have the parliamentary election. They will both have their own unique dynamics as elections in our countries have their unique dynamics. Um, and that's all to be encouraged. Your question is about, so what do you do? So what do we do when we're in an election? Do we just kind of, you know, do we down tools and say, hey, getting too complicated, whatever? I think we, we figure out through our systems and our institutions, of which Ukraine has some, maybe not enough yet, we figure out how do you drive continuity of effort through this period. And I think it's really important for us not to uh, say to Ukraine, you know what, we're gonna take our foot off the gas pedal at the moment because you're going into an election. I think that that would be absolutely the wrong signal. Obviously, I'm sitting here with a minister from Ukraine and, and uh, she may have a different point of view. But you know, when you look, first of all, let's just go back to the context of this. We tend to forget everything about Ukraine for some reason. It's been four years since the revolution of dignity, four years. In my country, a government can hardly get anything done in four years. They're just getting their head around how they're gonna get a second term so that they can actually get done the stuff they wanna get done. So again, I, I don't wanna sugarcoat and I don't wanna be a Pollyanna for Ukraine, but I do think a bit of context is important because aside from that four years, the scope and scale and level of ambition for what Ukraine has set out for itself in terms of reform, that is reform everything at the same time would be eye-watering in any context, but then, Let's not forget, there is a war. So, and, and, that, and it's a real war, and everybody's described it so well, and General Abizaid has described it so well, Masha, last night. I mean, this isn't, it isn't just what's happening on, you know, on the line of contact, and it isn't just the, you know, the egregiousness of what happened in Crimea, but it is the daily insidious impact of disinformation, of chaos inducing, of uncertainty infusing that is going on absolutely every day. And so, I mean, you put all that together and you say, okay, and you've got an election, you're going for it, what do, what do you need to do? Well, let's bear that context in mind. And I think we need to focus on what we would call the aki. I don't know how that translates, but it's sort of the givens in reform to date. It's those foundational things. Again, the ministers described so well the amazing progress that's been made in health reform. Let's look at the law and national security that was hard fought. Let's look at NABU. Let's look at an independent national bank. Let's look at the progress that's been made on electoral form in the judiciary. There is so much that has been done. And that stuff should continue through this process of, of, of democratic change. Now, it's the right of an incoming government to kind of um, rejig that if they fancy. That's what democracy is about. But I think if we focus on that sort of institutional level and you look at where uh, the dynamism of civil society in, in Ukraine has taken things to date, working a partnership with reform-minded uh, Ukrainians with the help of the international community, I think there's a lot to work on here. And my final point would be that we have to always remember that unlike so many places in the world, we didn't come to Ukraine and say, hey, we think you need a Euro-Atlantic vision and vocation. They decided it for themselves. And four years ago, they did something that seems like quite amazing. They actually took to the streets because they wanted to be part of like the European Union and the European vision. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting in the current context to think that people would demonstrate, fight, march, and say, we want to be part of this broader Euro-Atlantic family. You know, please, please have us. We didn't bring this agenda to them. They 
develop this agenda, they set their political direction, and they've just said, and it would be nice if some of you would kind of kind of help us through this. Let, let me pick up on your last point. As you rightly point out, Ukrainians, in many respects, I think, deserve a better political elite than they've gotten over the past couple of decades. Twice in a decade, They've gone out in the streets, the second time at enormous cost and sacrifice, mm -hmm. demanding better from their leaders, better from their government, an end to corruption, an orientation that was more westward. And yet you look at the poll numbers and most of the political leaders aren't doing terribly well to understate it. Um, is there this expectation and demand and desire on the part of Ukrainians, the mm -hmm. people, um, that they just want more reforms along the lines of what the Ministry of Health has been able to accomplish, but that they're not seeing elsewhere throughout the government. How, how warranted are their um, frustrations with, with the government, even though you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. it's only four years since the, the last revolution? Well, I won't comment on political elites in the contemporary international environment, because they're all a little bit uh, confused at the moment, I think. <laughs> um, but, that is a fair point. <laughs> uh, but I think it's not unusual, uh, and I'm not going to burst into song, but it's not unusual for publics to get frustrated with their governments. That's kind of normal, especially when you have high expectations. And look at the excitement and the hope that came out of the revolution of dignity, a revolution of dignity. Mm -hmm. Just those words are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And everybody's writing me off because they think, oh, she's all starry-eyed about Ukraine. I'm not. But there is something, and it is four years. And the government has moved along a lot of stuff simultaneously on tons of tracks. And there are problems with corruption. We know there are all sorts of issues out there. Um, it's not unusual for, uh, for, for people to get fed up with their political leadership and say, look, we're just going to toss them. We're going to send a message. We're going to do whatever. I don't think there is anything that uh, you know strange about the dynamics in the political uh, situation in Ukraine at the moment. Um, I think it's very important for us to stay steady, keep calm and carry on, as John said, to stay the course and let Ukrainians, who have shown themselves to be extremely wise uh, and extremely effective in getting their messages uh, to their leadership, to, to support them in doing what it is they want to do in terms of moving along this road to that Euro-Atlantic integration. I'm sorry you didn't break out into song, but in any event. I could. Um, General, let me turn to you. Uh, the UK, along with the United States and Russia, signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, in which Ukraine uh, agreed to relinquish its nuclear weapons in exchange for respect for its sovereignty and territorial integrity. How has your country, my country, um, we know how Russia's handled the Budapest Memorandum, but how have we done in living up to uh, what we said in that memorandum? Uh, your question is also the answer, I think. <laughs> okay, I mean, Hold on. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, uh, if, I, if I may, the, the, the position that Ukraine finds itself in now is as has already been said on a number of occasions, that the international community really does need to get its act together as a group, which may well not have been the case in the past. And our experience, my experience over the last two years, has been that there's a huge amount of effort, actually, going into the country. It's rather as if there are, there are people with loud hailers pointing them at the Ukrainians and shouting through the loud hailers. And of course, the American loud hailer is by far the biggest and loudest and least intelligible. Um, <laughs> um, but if, you, if, you're, if you're a Ukrainian, you're, you're listening to this, and it's quite confusing. You certainly turn to the one that you think you're going to get the most supply from. I think the, the challenge is that you, you don't always define your demand as clearly as you could. And the key thing now for, for the, the international community is not to concern itself too much about w however you wish to interpret the behavior in the past. And we'll all have our own private views on that. Uh, but to try now to demand as coherently as you can the support that you need and then integrate it 
and bring it into your country as well as you can. Our experience in the military is that uh, there is a tendency for us to act a bit like teachers, a bit like the people who know the solution. And my experience has been that the, there is a, there's a deep uh, professional competence that sits underneath the relative, and they're not, they're not superficial, but the, the challenges that face the Ukrainian armed forces at the moment um, are not that their people have no desire, double negative, I'm sorry, have no desire to, to achieve better. They are very proud of their professionalism, but they feel that they haven't got the structures or the equipment to do the job more effectively. Now, let's respect that. Let's uh, try to listen better to the signals that are coming from them, and then let's try to deliver what is needed in a coordinated way at the right point at the right time. But, but do you think we have fallen short of what Ukrainians expected from us? Mm -hmm. Giving up nuclear weapons, to put it mildly, was a pretty monumental decision in 94. Yeah, the, 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 the issue... I mean, it's, it's to the point where some Ukrainians say, we wish we hadn't done it, maybe sure. we should but I, I, try to reacquire I, the capability. Surely the issue today is that, um, I mean, I think if my statistics are right, 117 members of the Ukrainian armed forces have been injured, and uh, I think 19 have been killed on, in the Donbass since um, April. I think 93 civilians have been injured and uh, a dozen or so killed. Th this is the issue of the moment, is how to address the, the challenge of uh, aggression uh, at a time of great institutional uncertainty inside your country. And, and what can we do, as Jill has just said, to help build foundations that will be strong enough to last through the uncertainty that is particularly going to exist over the next 12 months. I mean, the only other contextual thing that I think I should say is that I think the British elected to leave the European Union about, I know exactly, two and a half years ago. And we still haven't got into a position where we know what the outcome is. And, and we're looking at a country that has, is going through significant transformation in contact. Now, that, that has to be the issue of the moment, not what happened years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we do address that because the, our, our chat, the international community's challenges will emerge over the next 18, 12 to 18 months if we don't address the matters of today rather than harping back to the issues of the past. Um, Alana, I, I heard you say when, when, when Nick mentioned uh, that we have a tendency to act like teachers, you, you uh, agreed with that comment. Uh, give us a little critique of how the West has approached trying to help Ukraine, but perhaps in some cases has not been so helpful. Uh, okay, before I do that, I just wanted to say a couple of things. When you talked about uh, what's going to happen with elections and are we going to decelerate and are we going to slow down, on the other, completely opposite, we are accelerating so that we get as much done and in, as many institutions in place before, if, if there is a governmental change, before the change in government. There are 10 ministries that have been chosen to do a transformation. We now are creating uh, directorates with director generals and agents of change, agents of reform. Our ministry is one of them. We're completely transforming our ministry so that um, 10 of the ministries will have professional civil servants that will continue implementing the policy that's already been put in place even after the political, um, political elite changes. Uh, ministers are appointed, but the civil servants will stay in place and continue the policy. I and mean, that's what uh, um, uh, uh, true um, democracy that has chosen a policy long term should continue to do. Another thing I wanted to talk about was um, the role of civil society. Civil society is very important in Ukraine. They're very important for us as well in our reform. Um, and one of those uh, things that civil society helps us with is the coordination for the donors. We started doing that in the Ministry of Health and we've been much more um, efficient in um, uh, having the donors um, uh, 
do the things we need for them to do rather than what the donors want to do. Unfortunately, donors come in with their own preconceived notion and they want to do what they want to do, whether Ukraine needs it or not. Mm -hmm. um, that happens very often. Um, that happens in the military as well. So, uh, say in the very beginning of the war, I remember in the summer of 2014, I actually met with a couple of uh, colonels in the Hilton Hotel in Kyiv, and we started talking to them about how uh, our organization, Patriot Defense, had already started tactical medical training, and we were tra training combat medic course, um, combat lifesaver courses, long-range patrol medic courses, and they looked at me and they said, how do you know about this stuff? I mean, you're some civilian that came in. I said, well, you know, Google. And um, I, I mean, what do you do first, right? Google. Um, and then we found uh, professional trainers in uh, Germany that trained NATO and the US military. We brought them in and we started training as forces. And they came in and they said, well, we're gonna bring in a mobile hospital, you know, and we're gonna, an EMEDS hospital, we're gonna bring it in and help the Ukrainians. I said, well, you know, we have local, small local hospitals. We don't need a mobile hospital. We need training so the doctors in those small local hospitals know how to take care of the patients when they come in. Well, they didn't listen. And the next summer, a $3 million EMEDS hospital was brought into Ukraine. And it sat in Zhitomir, which those of you who know Ukraine know that's far from the front lines, for about um, a year. And then it got brought in to Kramatorsk, which again, not very close to the front line, because the Americans wanted it deployed. So it sat, they made a tent, and nobody was using it, because they didn't listen. So that's the professionalism part of it. Listen to what the Ukrainians need as well. I know they always come in with a long list of give us javelins, give us you know, F-18s, whatever, <laughs> give us all of this stuff, but listen to when they say we need certain types of training that it really is necessary for them. Um, one of the things I want to say also, which um, uh, helps, is you have to give practical reasons why the training will be helpful. So say when um, we were doing tactical medical training, the first word is tactical. So we not only had medical trainers, but we had tactical trainers that we brought in. And those tactical trainers were commandos, um, paras, and uh, they started teaching Ukrainian military four-man fire teams instead of the six-man fire teams that the Soviets have. So when uh, the Soviet system had, so when the Ukrainians said, we like our six-man team, we don't want to change, we don't want to learn anything, they told them, listen, if it's a sniper is standing there looking at you and your four-man fire team comes in, he's going to be waiting for those last two guys because he's used to a six-man fire team. When there's only four of you, that split second, even those few seconds you get from having only four rather than six can save your lives and can make your operation successful. And when you gave them a, a, a reason why it's successful or why it's necessary, they accepted it. And they started working in four-man fire teams. So these are the kinds of things you need to do is um, understand that there is a tradition. There's a military tradition. It's the Soviet military tradition, but there is a military tradition in Ukraine. And you know what the military tradition is, is like in the United States. I mean, it's, it's your tradition. You don't want to move away from it and do something different unless there's a really good reason for it. So give them the reason. Give them a good reason and they'll listen. Jill, let me, let me shift to uh, NATO. The people in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, Poland, sleep better at night with Article 5 security guarantees. Mm -hmm. Still wary of Russia and what they might do that wouldn't necessarily trigger Article 5, but they're, they're safer, certainly, as members of NATO. General Hodges and I were in Tbilisi a couple of weeks ago for a conference and Georgians are pretty frustrated with the lack of progress that they have seen since Bucharest over 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, in which NATO said Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. Mm -hmm. Is this an issue that we should be helping Ukraine move ahead on NATO membership? Is it unrealistic to expect that there would be consensus within the alliance? Is it too divisive an issue for Ukraine as a, as a whole to try to deal with? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really easy question. Um, and we're discussing it just as our defense ministers are meeting in NATO, I think. So, timely. Um, 
Look, again, you know, the, the alliance is a, is a curious and wonderful beast. Uh, it works by consensus, and it has all sorts of uh, dynamics that relate to national interests. And it's no secret that, um, I mean, Canada's, you know, the Canadian government's been way out there in saying, let's move ahead with Ukraine. Uh, but we just don't have agreement around the table. And, you know, some of uh, Ukraine's closest neighbors have... Uh, have issues of, of politics or policy, you can determine which is driving what, um, that, is, that are preventing us uh, you know, moving to uh, easy agreement, even to have things like NATO-Ukraine council meetings, which we think is, is really, really a pity. You know, we need to have those discussions. We're very lucky that we've got the UK-led uh, Quint uh, organization, which is an, uh, is an informal uh, gathering of, of Ukraine's closest friends, and, and we sit down at these ministerial meetings and, and have a chance amongst uh, Canada, the United States, um, Lithuania, Poland, and the UK to talk about Ukraine and make sure that we build that solidarity of effort behind uh, Ukraine. But uh, I don't think that uh, the NATO track is going to move ahead quickly. Having said that, I don't think it's all about NATO, and I've had this conversation with my Ukrainian uh, friends and partners. You know, NATO has said that, uh, sorry, Ukraine has said that what it uh, aspires to is NATO interoperability. It has set out NATO standards and principles as its goal, and Euro-Atlantic standards and principles more broadly. There's a lot of work to be done to get from here to there. Um, what would be so bad if you had a Ukraine that ended up being more like a Finland in terms of NATO compatibility uh, and being able to operate with NATO than being part of the alliance? Now, of course, the immediate reaction is, yeah, but there's no Article 5. Article 5, uh, Article 5 does make people, I guess, sleep better at night, but there are ways of building that sense of solidarity, your own capacity and capability, your own sense to project, uh, your own ability to project kind of your, your deterrent effect because you have friends and you are capable and you are ready and you are joined up with other partners. Um, and NATO membership uh, may be an aspirational goal, um, but I think if what you're looking at is how do you best position Ukraine to uh, be sovereign, to be stable, to be secure, to be prosperous, NATO membership is kind of maybe nice to have, but there's a bunch of other stuff that is much more important uh, on the route to that. So, General, let me turn to you, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience. Looking at Ukraine's experience in dealing with a Russian invasion and fighting Russian forces, these aren't separatists, they're Russians or they're Russian proxies. Um, what could Ukraine contribute, and has probably already, contribute to NATO itself in, in looking to bring in aspiring states. NATO also wants to know what countries could contribute. I think both Georgia and Ukraine feel that they have been on the front lines uh, defending against further Russian aggression. How do you see that dynamic? I, mean, I think speak, speaking from a, a purely professional uh, perspective, this is a laboratory. And I, I, we, we were told last night uh, how this is a it's, a, it's an asymmetric challenge. It's not just kinetic, and it's not, it's not just about tanks and aircraft. It's about subverting minds at the very highest level in order to get attitudes to change. Um, this is about attacking human security. It's, about, it's not just about a physical mm -hmm. fight. Mm -hmm. And um, my conclusions are that we need to be far better at integrating all the various strands of human security, not just focusing on the physical, not just allow, this is not a military fight. This is not something where you have a task force commander who is waving his arms about, but not just because it's, it, we're in an advisory role, but it's also because the threat that is being presented to us in this environment is very contemporary and very complex. And so I think the lessons that can be learnt from what is occurring in Ukraine at the moment are far bigger than NATO. The, this is about how do we address the contemporary security challenge to human security in economic, social, information and physical strands. And we haven't begun to think about this. Um, where, where, where does 
what the ambassador was saying last night about the IMF. Where does, where does business start to operate in a way that is part of building more coherent security for people in a particular area? How, how is that, in my military terms, <laughs> commanded? Of course it's not. Um, and, and there is a really big underlying issue here about how we address the way that our security is going to be challenged over the next 10, 20 years. And I, I am concerned that we failed to think clearly enough about what the agents are, how they're coordinated, how are they led with a soft L, uh, and, and how does that get integrated into the alliances and international organizations that a moment exists, at the moment exist in rather the same stovepipes that General Avazay talked about from a Ukrainian perspective. Let me just ask the three of you quickly. The, the, the fact that Ukraine is in this kind of gray zone, um, it, it's not a member of NATO, it aspires to join, it's not a member of the European Union, it aspires to join that, it's resisting the Russian push to be part of a Russian sphere of influence. Will these problems that Ukraine is experiencing continue as long as it remains in this gray zone? Who are you looking at? The uh, minister. I have, yeah. I have three yeah. eyes on normally, each of you. Normally, yeah. normally yeah. what I'll happens is they stuff the soldier out in front yeah. and then, you yeah, so I'll yes. say you something and the they, can, they, you take they, the can, <laughs> they can They're shoot. right behind you. Yeah, exactly. Fortunately now, I've forgotten right. what I the question was. Um, I think it's already been said that if, if Ukraine can make itself a stable country that has firmer foundations that can make its own democratic decisions, job done. I mean, we hope that it will look towards the West, but uh, what we should be doing is enabling it to make its own democratic decisions. And I think that's, uh, on, it's, that's a long-term process. I mean, my, only, I, my experience is 38 years in Northern Ireland in order to try and create a level of peace and stability that was acceptable to the people. This is a long process. Sure. And what we're doing today should be to build those parts of the foundation that allow the next phase of Ukrainians' self-development to be as balanced and as, as open as possible. I guess what I'm driving at is the, the true prospect of membership, of belonging or returning to Europe was so important for countries that were Warsaw Pact members, um, the Baltic states, and the fact that they joined, that there was this uh, carrot at the end. There was light at the end of the tunnel, and it wasn't an oncoming train. Um, was so important as an inspiration, as a motivating factor for reform in many of those countries, difficult reforms. Without that, incentive is is Ukraine just bound to sort of be in this neither here nor there? Fortunately, um, it's not up. I, I, can answer, I can't yeah. answer this because we're leaving. <laughs> there is that. Look, yes. um, I, think, I think it's really important, again, to recall kind of the context. You talk about the incentive for change, of, say, to, to Poland and Hungary and uh, to the, the Czechs and others. The prospect of uh, NATO and EU membership was always out there from the outset. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the Soviet Union was crumbling. And so there was never any question that those countries were on a trajectory to join those organizations. And I do think that that was a forcing function for reform. Even more remarkable, therefore, Ukraine knows that it is in a very, very lonely space. Mm -hmm. Very lonely. No one has promised them membership. Mm -hmm. They have said we would like to be members. Um, even so, they have put in place a reform program, which I think is extremely ambitious, and they are moving along it, fits and starts, disconnected, however you want to characterize it. The trajectory is very much on a reform trajectory. And that is without, I would say, 
the clear political horizon of membership in either of those organizations. I think, therefore, Ukraine, knowing they have got to kind of go it alone, are doing it for their own reasons, because they're public, their society, they have taken a decision, they would like to orient themselves in a different direction. If that ends up in membership at the end of the day, that's, that's good. And I think that as if I was leading Ukraine, I'd be putting it out there and probably stick it in the Constitution to give people that sense of hope. But more important is just to build that internal resilience and do these things for the reasons that make sense to Ukraine, not because we're pulling them into our organizations. We, for so long, have had that relationship with our partners that we've forgotten what it's like to have a partner that says, hey, actually, we can get on with this on our own if you support us. And just to reprise quickly on your previous question to me about Article 5. As I think about it, if I wanted, if I was in Ukraine and I wanted to sleep better at night, I think I would like more my IMF tranche than Article 5 guarantees at the moment because that is of a more immediate and important macroeconomic stability going forward for my country, which is what is the essence of security at the end of the day. So I don't consider that Ukraine is in a gray zone. I think Ukraine is in a blue and yellow zone. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine has made its choice, and it's not a gray zone anymore. Ukraine is uh, oriented toward the West. Ukraine has visa-free regime with Europe. Ukraine has increased by uh, leaps and bounds the amount of trade it's doing with Europe. It's cut itself off from Russian gas, uh, decreasing the amount of trade it's doing uh, in uh, that direction. So I think that um, it really isn't in a gray zone anymore. Um, the other thing is... Uh, that um, in the end it is the choice of the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainian people will decide uh, if they want to be in NATO, if they don't. Being in NATO might be very dangerous for Ukraine because it will always be then right on the front line of where NATO is. Um, it may very well be that the, um, uh, the type of uh, relationship that it will have with Europe and with the uh, NATO partners will be different than any other one. It may be a unique relationship, which is perfectly fine. That unique relationship might then spread to Georgia and to some of the other countries that would like to be closer in partners. So um, I agree that right now Ukraine is, um, and it's kind of a strange thing to say, but a laboratory. And what's going on in Ukraine is something that's unique and different. It's a new discovery, and it's uh, like we're doing some sort of clinical trial on uh, what's going to happen there. Um, and uh, we'll have to see how the patient does. Uh, but the patient's doing well right now and uh, is really on its road to recovery. Said like a true doctor. Thank you. Um, I will open it up. Um, Karen, how much time do we have? Ten minutes. Okay, I saw Glenn's hand first. And if you would please identify yourselves, and then we'll go. Let's collect a, a couple, and then we'll uh, come to the panel. Thank you, um, Glenn Howard. I'm president of the Jamestown Foundation. I, I think Minister Saprun had a very, uh, a very interesting observation about um, Ukraine, uh, treating Ukraine as a patient and and with the disease and what is needed are preventative measures that you need to deal with. And she you mentioned uh, the issue of Ukraine corruption. If we go to talk about a specific issue, the question that I have, push that further to national security. Case in point, Ukraine lost the only ammunition producing plant it had in Donbass. Ukraine has been without a, a major ability to produce its own ammunition for four years. It can't produce, uh, it can't produce uh, 155 artillery shells. What happened in Donbass in 2014, 2015, the U.S. was trying to search for ammunition from Eastern Europe to get it to Ukraine. Ukraine lost last year four ammunition dumps were uh, suffered explosions, inability to protect its own ammunition. The problem here is that we know that this issue is being raised inside the Ukrainian government. They won't, for whatever reasons, we can't move them to build their own ammunition plant, although there's reports now that they're going to do this. But this is, if, if we, as a U.S. government, can try to focus on key areas of national security, which we think are really important, again, I'm not privy to what General Abizé and Ambassador Yanovich, what, what is said. Uh, with the U.S. government and how they get them to go forward. But it seems to me, it seems to me that if we pick selective issues that are important and try to deal with issues that have a, uh, an impact, like VOA, that the Ukrainian people seem to trust as a news source, that this somehow moves them in a way on key national security issues. And case of point is the island class 
uh, patrol boats. That's a success story that was done with VOA working, moving it, and putting the pressure on Parshenko to, to move forward with that. That's my question, is that can we move on other issues that we select as really urgent top issues for Ukraine that we're not getting any traction in any other areas? Okay, the mic there, and then there, and then there. I think I am oh, there, 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 and there. Okay. <laughs> that was clear. Thank you for, so, <coughs> excuse so me. Please try to be brief. Okay, Elise Giuliano, I'm a professor at Columbia University, and I'm doing research on political opinion in East Ukraine. And um, I just have a question, this is a great panel, but I have a question for Dr. Suprun. And the first, uh, the question is, well, two things. I, I did research in Kharkiv, and I heard a lot about the problem with doctors' salaries and doctors going to Poland, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. And, and second of all, PR, because in our focus groups that we're doing, uh, we didn't ask them about your reforms, and uh, it just came up very often, and there seems to be a lot of confusion or um, resistance, I would even say, when people don't quite understand some of the um, really impressive and aggressive reforms that your ministry is doing. And I wonder if you could address this issue and um, discuss a little bit about PR, because PR is a really critical element of how people understand the reforms and what their government is doing. Thank you. And right there. Yes. I'm Volodymyr Dubovic uh, with the University in Odessa. I have a quick comment on NATO membership. I think the logic of discussion here with our Western friends is often, uh, uh, if often uh, false. It's the wrong sequence. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we depart, or you depart, from assumption, which is a clear assumption that there's no clear path for Ukraine to NATO membership uh, anytime soon, uh, which means we should discourage, therefore, Ukrainians from even thinking and talking about NATO membership. Uh, and I think it's wrong because uh, clearly, first thing, uh, we have uh, grown uh, pro-NATO pro membership aspirations and attitudes in Ukrainian society. Uh, I'm not sure if we should um, uh, put changes in constitution in that respect or should have a referendum like Poroshenko suggested earlier. Maybe not. Uh, but at the same time, to discourage Ukrainians from talking about the membership is probably a wrong thing because we should probably even kind of encourage this pro-Euro-Atlantic, Euro-Atlantic aspirations within Ukrainian society. That's my view. And second of all, whatever you do with the Ukrainian army, whatever assistance you get to it, uh, it's still going to be a symmetric conflict. It's still going to be a gray zone, I'm afraid. I mean, uh, even Ukraine, democratic, viable, stable society, is pretty much open to the Russian aggression in the future unless it becomes a part of a viable uh, in security structure. And that's a lot of questions are, of course, in the air. What happens to NATO? What happens within NATO? Is there American leadership? Is there, I mean, there are many questions there. But assuming NATO is moving in the right direction, then Ukraine's place should be within NATO in the future, in the longer term. I don't know when. It's my opinion. If you want to have Ukraine firmly secured against potential uh, repetitions of Russian aggressions. And the question is primarily that I have is primarily to you, David Kramer, to better capitalize on you being on this panel, not just a moderator. Uh, it's a very hard uh, business for our Western friends to calibrate the message to Ukrainian governments these days. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you don't want to appear uh, flattering, only focusing on achievements, uh, neglecting some of the things that haven't been done. On the other hand, uh, you cannot focus just on failures. Uh, appearing, uh, playing to the tune of Russian propaganda and appearing, uh, criticizing Ukraine and kind of backstabbing Ukraine. It's a thin line. And I think Ambassador Ivanovich here yesterday, she, she, she walked that line really uh, kind of masterfully and uh, presented us with a balanced view of what's going on within Ukraine. But I wonder, David, uh, if you think there are, that maybe there is a need for new, more nuanced, uh, radical, not radical, but uh, creative approaches in terms of getting the message delivered to Ukrainian membership leadership in the sense that the patience here is not indefinite. Uh, that there is no carte blanche, you know, that there is a, a contingency uh, to the assistance that Ukraine is receiving to what Ukraine's performance is. And I remember you clearly yourself and some other big, big friends of Ukraine here in the US talking a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, about maybe applying some sanctions or targeting certain people in the current Ukrainian leadership structures for blocking the reform, for not doing the right thing. Thank you. Thanks. If we can go over to the general. And Walter, and there, I think there was one more. Ben Hodges from uh, Center for European Policy Analysis and the class of 1980. <laughs> <laughs> B Navy, again. Um, to uh, Ms. St. Clair and uh, General Parker, uh, any uh, impact or effect of the delivery of the 
javelins uh, to Ukraine. Thanks. A model of brevity. Uh, Walter. <laughs> uh, hold on, Walter. Microphone's coming. Not that you need one, but. <laughs> I uh, just would sort of like to uh, uh, channel my inner, uh, oh, yeah, Walter Zaritsky, uh, director of the Center for U.S.-Ukrainian Relations. Uh, I'm going to be channeling, especially since I'm sitting with the Jamestown Foundation people, um, I'm going to be channeling my inner Paul Goebel. Um, question to everyone on, on the panel, and that is informational warfare, something we've known, we knew in the Cold War. We seem to have forgotten it in the 90s and the early 2000s. We stopped spending money on it. Is the West, or does the West, really understand that we're here talking about helping Ukrainians, but how about helping Ukrainians and helping ourselves as well? Um, and that is to restart some of those programs that were out there that actually told the truth about what was going on in the world. We had very effective programs, and uh, we don't seem to have the wherewithal or the will uh, to repeat those programs. So I'm addressing that issue, the issue of informational warfare and how we can help the Ukrainians by putting out really serious information out there. Squeeze in the last one right there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's the last one. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alina Nikolenko, Associate Professor of Political Science here at Fordham University. I have a question about transitional justice, uh, because several of you mentioned uh, in passing uh, the relation of dignity. Uh, and I think one of the issues uh, that uh, a lot of Ukrainians have with the incumbent government is that they, it has not dealt effectively with the past uh, crimes. Um, are there any lessons we can learn from uh, Ireland or from other countries? of how you know, the government can deal with the security services, uh, uh, oligarchs, uh, others who are actively involved uh, in uh, crimes uh, uh, against uh, civilians um, and uh, the perpetration of violence in Eastern Ukraine right now. I mean, I can pick uh, Renat Akhmetov, for example, or somebody else. You know, those oligarchs continue to lead uh, a comfortable life just relocating from Donetsk to Kiev, is, and it sends a negative message, and it puts into question uh, the commitment of the incumbent government to reforms. Um, and maybe a, another related question is about the impact of international trade with Russia on domestic politics in Ukraine. Uh, because a lot of Ukrainian wealthy businessmen still continue to trade and have assets in Russia, including the incumbent president. So what kind of impact uh, does uh, do um, trade relations with Russia. Russia is still the number one trade partner uh, with Ukraine right now. What kind of this international trade have uh, on political stability and economic stability in Ukraine? Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, why don't we start on this and Nick, why don't you uh, go first, please. Uh, pick up on any of these that you want to. Okay, I'll pass. Um, the, um, well, just the, 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 how do you focus on the key issues? Um, and I mean, you, you reference the inability to protect or produce ammunition. This goes back to a point that I made, that the, uh, when I spoke, the, the international community has got to work with the Ukrainians to focus its efforts in particular areas. I mean, there are a number of themes that we're addressing at the moment that that are driven by a Ukrainian need, where what we're trying to do is to corral the international community to, to provide support, both material support and advisory support in a way that is appropriate. And it's based on their priorities. And my experience has been that their priorities tend to mirror, in my, in my view, the security priorities that uh, you would expect to come from a country in that position. So I think it is being themed better. I think there are some clear areas of weakness. I think it would be wholly inappropriate to discuss them in an environment like this. But my, my feeling is that we've become more, more effective in working with them to focus on the key security issues. Um, the, the, the business of PR, which just as in passing, one of the themes that we have been trying to work 
with the, min the Ministry of Defence and the General Staff is over STRATCOM, strategic communications. It is not an area which comes naturally to that particular part of the Ukrainian government. We, we believe they should be better at communicating out. They have, as you say, got some very good stories to promote, and they don't, don't always get them out in time into the right environment. So there's, there's um, um, a prospect there. I, the impact of javelins has been significant. Uh, it's sent a number of messages. It's not about the weapon systems. It's about US support. Uh, it's about the Ukrainian ability to deal with tactical threats. Um, it, it, has, it has opened up the door for other conversations yeah. about um, providing support. So it's been, a, 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 in my view, coming from a country whose pockets are rather less deep, it's been a significant step and yeah. has had both tactical and strategic implications. And I'm, um, I mean, the reconciliation thing, ah, it, it is po it's political. It is, it is, it is not, it's not something which can happen without genuine political desire for change. And in our experience in Northern Ireland, we candidly are not getting it right because there are still there are still impacts of a 38-year uh, conflict which ha are not being properly addressed as far as reconciling the sides are concerned. So it, it, all I would say, unhelpfully, is that this is extremely difficult to do and requires really deep political leadership. Um, I'll uh, address the question about, uh, about NATO uh, membership. Um, I hope that nobody thought I was discouraging uh, Ukraine from seeking membership. It's not for us to encourage or discourage. It's for Ukrainians to decide whether they would like to apply for membership, which they have done. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's important. But I do think that the, more, the, the equally important piece of this is not to focus on becoming the member, but what it means to be a member. And that's where the Euro-Atlantic standards and principles, this isn't ticking boxes of interoperability and J codes and all that sort of stuff. This is about the principles, about the mindset, about what it means to be part of the Euro-Atlantic family. Extremely important. I mean, I don't know what would be wrong with a Ukraine that looked like Australia, that kind of is not a member of the alliance, but is part of the family with, you know, compatible capability, similar mindset. Again, I'm not discouraging uh, membership at all. It's not for me to discourage or encourage. But I just don't get obsessed by the membership thing because it's going to lead you in the wrong directions of frustration when, in fact, there is so much that you can do within the let's work more closely with NATO in a spirit of Euro-Atlantic solidarity, which is what Ukraine has said it wants to do. So I just say would not, don't, don't get stressed out uh, by, by that or overly focused on that. In terms of the messaging, I want to echo just what, what Nick has said, because I think whether it's in terms of the kind of the, the progress that's been made on social, economic, and other reforms, or in the area of, uh, of security sector, those messages, for whatever reason, are, are not getting out effectively. And I think we can all do much, much better as partners of Ukraine in, in helping get those, those messages out. But also, I think it is an area where Ukraine, I mean, part of the challenge is that, that there's a bit of maybe trust and skepticism, or a lack of trust and skepticism sometimes, uh, depending on who delivers those messages. Um, uh, and then the final point I would mention is just about messaging to the Ukrainian government. Um, never confuse what is said publicly with what is said privately. Thank you. Um, the uh, do very specific questions about doctor salaries and things like that we'll talk about separately because I don't want to take a lot of time explaining. It's a long explanation. Um, I think that the um, question about uh, VOA and what kind of uh, pressure does press or transparency have on uh, making decisions in Ukraine, as well as the informational warfare and uh, the PR, um, are really all tied together. Um, there are very few trusted um, uh, media outlets in Ukraine. Uh, most of them are owned by the oligarchs and they have their own vested interests. So that's why people don't know as much about healthcare reform as they should because all we get is smeared on all of those uh, media outlets. Uh, they do trust VOA and when there are stories written on VOA about certain things and it's listened to at the highest level in government, believe me, they read their Facebook pages and they read your Facebook pages. They're very interested in what's being talked about on all of these different levels. It's something that really makes a difference. Um, in the informational warfare, it's, it's insidious. It's everywhere. 
I don't know if you read the recent statistics about vaccinations and how Russian trolls are affecting vaccination rates in the United States. They're doing it 100 times worse in Ukraine. In Ukraine, we have less than 50% vaccinated children against most diseases because of these informational wars. It's not just about military. It's not just about uh, difference in information. It's outright lies, and it's um, coming in on both sides of the argument to create a false controversy that's not there. Um, these things happen every day, and we're fighting against it. And then there are really great programs like Stop Fake, which is at the um, uh, Cave Mohilla Academy School of Journalism. There's an English language, Stop Fake, that comes out. And it only has 100 views, 100 views in the world. There isn't enough interest in what this is. And one last thing I want to say about communication is in the Ukrainian um, budget, uh, say in the Ministry of, of Health budget, we have a tiny little amount of money that's given to our press service. That's it. No money for communication. All communication funding comes from our donors. So donors. We need communication help because uh, we do need to come up with better ways of communicating so that we get the information out there. Um, trade with Russia. It's not just a Ukrainian problem. Um, I've started a, a um, campaign in Ukraine that I will not sign the registration of any Russian produced or even Russian distributed medicines, pharmaceuticals in Ukraine. There is no legal reason for this other than I think it's wrong, and uh, so does my ministry. Johnson & Johnson puts Ukraine in the Russian sphere, and all of the uh, distribution of medicines through Johnson & Johnson comes through Moscow. So I have refused to register any, re-register any of their medicines until they change that. And it's been a year, and they're finally getting around to changing it. So it's not just Ukraine that is having problems with breaking away from Russia. I mean, there's been so many years of um, integration with Russia that in you know, 27 years of independence and 70 years in the Soviet Union, it's hard to break all those ties right away. But we're working on it, and we're working on it, and VOA and others who talk about it more and more, it'll wor will work on it better. And the last thing about the javelins. In the military, it's made a big difference. Um, I don't know if it really has made a difference on the battlefield because I don't go there that often. Last time I was there, the javelins still weren't in. What I can say is the uh, military parade that happened on uh, uh, Independence Day, javelins on top of Ukrainian-made vehicles, the most favorite thing that everybody saw. <laughs> so I can tell you that for the Ukrainian people, it was a tremendous, um, tremendous proof of support from the US, and in everyone's mind, that means NATO, that means Europe, that means the uh, Euro-Atlantic Alliance, and that it really made a very significant difference for the people of Ukraine. And, and I'll just close by saying um, I, I do give the current administration credit for the decision to um, sell javelins to Ukraine. I deeply regret the previous president, and it was the president, it wasn't his administration, but the president refused to do so. Um, against the advice of not just virtually every member of his cabinet and the vice president, but uh, almost every member of Congress. Um, the question about sanctions, uh, th we really have to distinguish between the kind of sanctions we're talking about for Putin's regime and any targeted sanctions that might be applied in the case of Ukraine. No, no, I know, I, I know you weren't conflating the two. Um, for, for the Putin regime, we, we have to do more in the way of sanctions. They can, they can adjust to the level of sanctions that, are, that exist right now. There, there are many more sanctions, including targeted ones, that we can apply collectively, not just the United States. In the case of Ukraine, it's an article I wrote a few years ago about tough love for Ukraine. Um, and I emphasize the word love, but I think we also have to be tough at times and, and underscore to them the importance that they can be their own worst enemies and leave their country vulnerable and exposed for Russia to exploit and take advantage. And so, um, I, as I said before, Ukrainians, I don't know of any other people who twice in a decade turned out in the streets <laughs> demanding better for their country. Um, and I wish the, the political leadership would recognize what Ukrainians are willing to sacrifice and make a, a small sacrifice for themselves. Um, please join me in uh, thanking this terrific panel uh, here this morning.